we're here tonight to have a lively, interactive, conversational exchange on the lead up to the high level meeting on NCDs in New York at the UN in September and beyond. We're really meant to sort of look beyond. There has been considerable recent progress, and I'm sure we'll hear from our speakers about much of that progress. The Moscow Ministerial, the WHO analyses, the <clears throat> work that Lancet has done, the work that the NCD Alliance has pioneered, the work that the business community has taken in getting itself organized. And I think it's very important that the, to, to mention the sort of nascent and building interest that's being shown in many of the major governments within, within the world, including in our own government. Um, next week, uh, Michelle Obama will be in South Africa and in Botswana with a big focus on wellness and activity and really it's, it's, it's about talking about the same kind of agenda uh, that she has pioneered here domestically into a setting in Southern Africa. I think that's very promising. I think that's, that's an important signal. And we could cite very, many other uh, examples from other places in the world where this consciousness is really, is really growing. Um, now, there are many outstanding challenges, and we're going to talk about those challenges today. And we've, we've had a few prior uh, discussions among ourselves about those, and we're defining them in sort of five areas, as areas that are going to be enduring challenges that are going to require continued effort. One is defining feasible and achievable targets and goals, and finding a way to make them understandable and integrated with the existing global health agenda. A second piece is leveraging resources, and leveraging resources in way that, ways that maybe go outside of our, of our normal expectations. They may be more private-based. They, they may be coming out of transactions. They, you know, the, the whole idea that this is a donor-driven response is different. And it's not really uh, the, the model for response in leveraging resources. We're struggling with what kind of response do you begin to engineer. And, and this, is, this challenge is occurring in a particularly poignant and difficult moment because of the global, global budgetary problems. Uh, and the acute stresses around that and the very crowded agenda and very anxious agenda around, around global health. The third area is integrating the business uh, sector uh, effectively into solutions. Uh, it's a complicated set of interests that come into play. Some are anxious and wary. Others, like Medtronic, have sort of stepped forward and played a facilitative and catalytic role. A fourth is forming a coherent and durable social movement. And I think that's where the NCD Alliance has been most pivotal in trying to group folks together, define an agenda, create unity and cohesiveness. But it's a tough, tough agenda, as many in this room can attest. And fifth is just ensuring high-level political leadership and buy-in. And that's at the head of state, finance minister, uh, uh, media, and opinion leaders. Um, and getting, getting this branded and embedded in their consciousness and made part of the dialogue. So we're going to organize our, our conversation this evening around two core questions. We're going to hear from our speakers. We're going to have a little bit of cross-conversation. We're going to come back to you at each point on those two questions for your comments and, 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 and questions. And there's a microphone here. Please come forward and do that. I'll just give you a preview of what those questions are going to be. The first, which we'll lead off with momentarily, is what can we realistically expect as the top line gains from a high level meeting in September? Let's start with that point. The second question, after we've, after we've gone through that one, the second one would be, how, do we, how are we going to manage and navigate the enduring challenges I just outlined, those five enduring challenges? In each, we'll have a round of conversation, hear quick answers, come back to you, uh, and then we'll close at the, at the close uh, we, uh, as we approach 9 p.m., uh, we will ask our, our panelists about, you know, what do they think is the single most important thing that needs to happen between now and September to really raise the prospects of success. So by way of introduction, I'm done. So let's move on now to the first question. The first question is, what can we realistically expect as a top-line gains from the high-level meeting in September. And I'm just going to go down to the end of the row here to Trevor and ask our speakers to just quickly give us a couple of top-line points on that. We can do maybe two minutes each, 
and then we can have a bit of cross conversation. So Trevor, yeah, lead us off, that, please. Steve. And thanks again for CIS's leadership <coughs> on all these issues. Uh, it's been a pivotal information sharing point. Thank you very much for that. First of all, awareness, awareness, and awareness. Those sound like three points, but in fact, it's just made for emphasis. Uh, there's a lot of disinformation, misinformation, lack of information. Having a greater level of awareness, not only at the base of the citizenry, but at the same time, at the level of a minister of finance, minister of economy, aside from the minister of health, is an incredible accomplishment. So we've achieved that goal coming out of September. We've certainly uh, made a, a leap forward. Uh, cross government and within government consensus, coming back to the point on how important it is that various aspects of governments themselves need to be talking with each other. Um, how is it that a, a, a healthy environment or the lack of action on NCDs, for example, uh, that may be of concern to the health minister, in fact, is as in, you know, should be of great interest also to the minister of economy who's trying to attract foreign investment into that economy. That we don't make it just about health and, and that it's talked about uh, across different governments in that same way but also just sim simply a, a framework for action. There's so many people that are, uh, I say, a little bit off-center when it comes to the topic for a variety of different reasons. And certainly, uh, if we can come out with the, the foundation uh, of the house being built, whatever you define that to be, whether it be just by getting the terminology right, getting the potential uh, best practices on the table through the meeting, that certainly is a place that we need to start. And then we can talk about the walls and the windows and the colors. Uh, that you want the walls painted. Thank you. Dr. Reddy. I think in your question, the critical term is realistically. So I will not get into optimistic aspirational statements as to what could happen and should happen. Uh, given the fact that previously, NCDs had not figured on the radar screen of international agencies and most national governments, I think the major gain would be to get the recognition that this is an important global public health challenge. Getting on the radar screen doesn't mean necessarily a smooth landing or a quick uh, landing. I believe that there would be statements of general intent to confront and control to some extent the NCD epidemic. But the gains I see are sensitization of high level leaders to the need for multi-sectoral policy instruments, which they have to coordinate across the government, and also giving them the necessary political will to direct their own health ministries to reconfigure health services to accommodate chronic disease prevention and control more effectively. Of course, this is assuming that we do our job well in communicating these messages to them and then get it across. I believe there would be a reaffirmation of the intent for global tobacco control through a better implementation of FCTC. Some reference may be made to other elements like alcohol, to availability of essential drugs, but I do not expect to see major commitments coming other than mm -hmm. in the area of tobacco control and to some extent uh, management of uh, uh, clinical uh, care services. But where I see the major gain coming in is that it will open the window, not only for national action, but for introduction of NCDs very clearly and unambiguously in the post-2015 revision of the MD MDGs. Mm -hmm. Because we would have then put our claim forward, and over the next two years, if we continue to advocate, we will get that in place, rather than just have a vague statement of communicable and other diseases. So we'll get our place firmly marked by making a success of this particular summit. Thank you very much. Paul. Steve, as you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, Europe and Eurasia, uh, more than 90% of all death is, uh, is related to non-communicable diseases and injuries. So by, by force, we have been forced to uh, recognize and begin to deal with many of these questions for a number of years. Uh, about five years ago, we put together the USAID's first um, assessment of non-communicable diseases. Um, and uh, since then, we've undertaken a number of very small but very successful programs dealing with non-communicable disease in, in several ways. 
things relating to uh, breast cancer and cervical cancer, mm -hmm. uh, some road safety work, again, injuries. Um, some things, uh, we're now looking at what happens to women when they go into a go into a clinic. Are they being checked for and screened for some of the typical non-communicable disease issues? We've done some work on, on um, uh, basically dealing with, with uh, the primary causes of death for women of reproductive age. So even despite all of that, it is really just a beginning. And for us, I would say that that that's represents my expectations for September. Um, there's been an incredible amount of work that has gone into the, the high-level meeting by a multitude of and a broad range of organizations and people. They've offered up lots of suggested outcomes, and I'm sure many of those are being talked about in the halls of this conference. Um, still, we are very much at the beginning. My expectations may seem relatively modest, but they would be enormous in advancing the agenda. I'll consider the meeting a success if it accomplishes three things. First, if it demonstrates broad and explicit national and international acknowledgement of the role of NCDs in global health and development. Secondly, if it heightens awareness of global disease patterns in 2011, mm -hmm. give us the reality of what the epidemics and, and epidemiology really is out there. Thirdly, if it recognizes that there are feasible and affordable approaches to NCDs uh, and, and their prevention and control. Now, as, uh, echoing Trevor and, and Srinath, I think you know, these are reasonable and practical and will form a, a reasonable foundation upon which to build. One thing is, is very clear, uh, the momentum is substantial and there is no going back. Thank you so much. Jahan. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I would echo what, what Paul just said. I think that the game has changed. I really do. And I, I celebrate. I'm very excited about what's going on. Um, Twelve years ago, when I first started in global chronic disease, as I mentioned, I, I, I thought I'd go to USAID and see if, um, if there was interest in this issue. And they trotted out Paul, because he was the one guy who talked about it. So true. <laughs> and I said, yeah, we have somebody uh, you know, who, who, who's concerned about this. I guess apparently now there's two of you or something like that. USAID or something like that. So um, I, I think that things have, have come a long way. I'm very, very excited about this. It doesn't mean that um, everything everything doesn't end in September. It just begins. Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a long-term um, <clears throat> game that we're in. Um, other things that I think we need to celebrate and that have already changed are that there's actually NCD alliances in 30 countries, more than 30 countries. That means that in, in countries like Kenya, in Uganda and Denmark and Australia, um, groups that hadn't necessarily uh, worked together and in some cases been aware of each other are now coming together as we joke, leave the weapons and the baggage at the door, come in, talk to each other, figure out our shared and common objectives. It's really, really good news. It's amazing. I think it's a lot to be proud of. Um, so even if NCD Alliance itself weren't to continue, the momentum is there. It's happening at the country level um, and NCD Alliance uh, is going to continue. I want to I emphasize that. Um, so there's, there's some things to be really excited about and, and proud of. And then we, we're starting to see some leadership by a few of, um, few of the bilaterals. Danita is funding, uh, the Danes are funding some of these NCD alliances in a modest way. Norwegians are doing some good things. Um, in terms of realistic goals, things that we can get out of the September meeting, absolutely, FCTC implementation is critical and doable. Um, you, NCDs in, in whatever the MDG successor goals also critical gives us some time to I think time to really um, get better uh, operations research and demonstration projects better evidence um, and uh, and hopefully for the economy to improve somewhat I think one thing that I learned um, in the in the most recent session at World Economic Forum um, that just occurred now was uh, that the cost of um, Inaction is, is far in excess of the cost of action. We're finally starting to have some good data. That's very important. We'll have more and more of that. We'll have good numbers by September. Um, we heard something along the line. We heard tens of trillions of dollars in terms of foregone um, income uh, as a result of these uh, diseases. So, so there's no question that um, that we ha we can make the economic case, and that's going to be important. And we'll have better data by September. So. 
And again, finally, yes, if there's a better understanding publicly of what NCDs are, that's going to be a, a really big victory. Um, that would depend, I think, on high-level attendance at the meeting as well. Thanks. Thank you. Peter. I have the disadvantage of being the last speaker, and I think my colleagues have covered a lot of the points. But I'll bring in a different perspective, that having been involved in HIV for the last 25 years, this actually reminds me of what happened in HIV. Um, in the mid-80s, uh, we went through the same thing of trying to get HIV recognized uh, and prevention efforts to start. And then the mid-90s, mid the same thing with treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what is different, though, about NCDs is it took a long time to get recognized. But the momentum in the last year or two has been incredible. I mean, when we FHI got involved, I couldn't get anyone to listen to me about NCDs. Now suddenly, every week there's a meeting on NCDs. And so one of the positive things, even before the September uh, meeting, is the fact that we have achieved some uh, measure of success. On the other hand, it would take a lot more than uh, the momentum that is currently good. And here are my expectations, uh, very similar to what my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, global recognition uh, of NCDs, uh, the social, economic, uh, and health impact, urgency of a global response at all levels, international level, the national level. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do at the country level, civil society and the business sectors. Uh, political and financial commitment and targets. Um, and then finally, um, country-driven and country-led approaches. We cannot afford the vertical, donor-driven uh, approaches. This has to be different. So those will be my expectations for the high-level meeting in September. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, there's a couple of couple things that you your comments trigger. You're all talking about changing consciousness and reusing this as a moment of registering uh, the the reality and the recognition, and that's a that is a sort of fundamental thing. None of you said this is the pivotal historical moment like UNGAS in, you know, 10 years ago, which I'm very happy to hear that that was not the case because this is a different reality and you're seeing it in those terms. Um, it's interesting that you're saying also that the economic data, the economic burden data is coming forward on top of the epidemiological and demographic data. And that will, I think, change the equation change the calculus around what does this mean and why should we care. And I also hear you saying that around the margins you're starting to see some political leadership beginning to appear around this issue. Um, I'm surprised that you haven't said more about it's got to be demand driven. It's got to be countries that are really stepping forward and pulling folks on this because they've made the calculation that they're their future economic growth and s society stability depends on addressing this issue. It seems to me that that is one of, the, one of the key junctures here. I also think that there's many sort of sensible, practical things that could come out of September, like eat less salt, eat less fat, exercise more and be less fat, um, smoke less and, and, and drink less alcohol. I mean, there's some, there are some messages that have very broad resonance which could come across that might actually help us uh, in a way in terms of the consciousness in elaborating. And maybe you could comment a little bit about, you know, what are the, what are the messages that might come out of this meeting in September that have a sort of broad resonance in getting people to a acknowledge that there's been this shift and that it really comes back to changes in the way we organize our societies and we organize our, both our prevention and treatment approaches. Peter? Yeah. In some ways, the message is already out, uh, but obviously in September this will be highlighted. And that there was uh, at the Moscow uh, meeting uh, uh, last month, there was a, some debate as to what actually should constitute NCDs. And I think the consensus was that uh, uh, we, should, we need to focus on the limited number of risk factors 
that uh, that's what led to the recognition that this has to be, the NCDs is not going to cover the whole spectrum, but it's going to be cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, and chronic, chronic respiratory diseases. And the risk factors that are related to these four, uh, the four big ones, uh, as you mentioned, tobacco, which contributes significantly to all three of them. I believe 70% uh, uh, of lung cancer, uh, tobacco contributes to about 70% of lung cancer, 40% uh, of chronic respiratory illnesses, and about 10% of CBD. So tobacco has to be the most, and it also has been one of the most successful interventions in industrialized countries. Uh, the second one uh, that, that you mentioned would be uh, dietary uh, uh, behaviors and physical activity. The third one will be alcohol intake. Um, and then uh, uh, those three probably will be uh, the, the three key messages. And I don't think we have to wait until September to recognize these. The difficulty will be uh, getting this uh, translated to the national level, to the uh, community level, and also trying to apply the lessons that have been led in industrialized countries uh, in the developing country settings. Uh, trying, for example, to ban smoking or increase taxes may not work as easily as it is in the developing countries as it's working in a place like uh, the, the US. Uh, and then also, uh, for example, uh, salt reduction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in established food industry, that's easy in an industrialized countries. In a country where most of the food industry is informal, then that would be a challenge. So there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, new things that we have to try uh, and adapt to a developing country setting. But I will sure enough. Yeah. Dr. Reddy. Uh, Steve, you label this session as a candid conversation. Yes. So let me be contrarian. <laughs> uh, eat less salt, eat less sugar, eat less fat. These are public health messages that have been going around even in low and middle income countries by health professionals. Yes. And uh, these heads of state gathering in the, UN, in the UN are not Oprah Winfrey or Dr. Oz. Uh, they are not the ones to actually communicate health messages about individual behavior change to people. What we want to really see from them is policy level action. Mm -hmm. If they can get the food industries to move in altering food processing, if they can actually start modifying some of the tobacco taxation policies, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or getting the salt uh, reduced in processed foods and fat substitution, it is those measures that require to be taken. The public messaging will, has gone on, will go on, it will go on through the NGO groups that are there, whether it's the Diabetes Foundation or the right. World Heart Federation. All of them with the national member societies will continue to do it. And it needs to come out. But what needs to come out at the UN summit is much more of a policy determination. And to address these risk and factors. A determination to advance those policies, not mere <laughs> health messaging. Yes. Jahan? Um, I think. Yeah, I, I would actually uh, agree with what, what Srinath said. I think, but I think one, one interesting thing that will happen at the summit actually is it's taking place in a city that's really become a world model for what cities can do around these issues. Cities are the source of part of the problem in terms of people being deprived of choices around food and around physical activity, um, being, uh, you know, being in smoked, smoky environments. Uh, they also are part of the solution and there will actually be some activities, some really interesting activities led by the city itself and by New York Academy of Medicine around um, showcasing New York City um, as the host of this event and as a, um, an example of what it is that cities can do. I think that's just an important um, piece to remember in all of this, particularly as we move towards more and more people living in, in, in large, sprawling, um, unplanned cities that, that help contribute to some of these risk factors. Um, the other piece, I think, and I guess it's maybe picking up on, um, on something you said, was, was just around donor-driven. I think there's a really interesting potential development here where I think a lot of this will actually be middle-income country-led, um, and it's not about getting outside donor funding, but it is about, mm -hmm. as Srinath said, reallocating priorities. Um, I don't know how that will play out. I can't pretend to understand that completely, but I think it's a really interesting way that this is also very different from the UNGAS in terms of that it is more, um, you know, the country led by the, by the, the large new economies that, um, or, or has the potential to be. Um, over the long term, country led by the large new economies that um, both are experiencing the burden but also have access to the solution and are, are becoming the leading economies worldwide. 
Paul. I, I think one of <clears throat> I would expect one of the one of the key messages that will come out of the of the uh, on gas would be the fact that um, non communicable disease burden need not be borne entirely by the health sector. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services refers to it as health in all policies. The, the point being that what we're talking about is not just the responsibility of a clinician or uh, the responsibility of a hospital. Um, it's also the responsibility of the people who plan our cities, the people who, uh, who uh, put together our tax structures, the people mm -hmm. who, who put together our transportation and, and grow our food and process our food. It's also the responsibility of individuals and families to take more responsibility for their own individual health and to realize the, the reality that governments cannot assure my family's health. I need to take responsibility in terms of the choices that, that I make, mm. the choices that I urge my, uh, my children and, and others that I, that I know uh, to make, and, and basically look out for ourselves. We call it patient empowerment. And I think that's going to be a, a theme that's going to be uh, running through the NCD. So this is you know, what I hear all of you saying is this is a fairly complicated case of shared responsibility in which you're looking for governments to embrace this as a matter of national policy and pushing forward. You're looking at businesses and changing their outlook and their approaches and coming to the table and you're looking at an appeal on individual choice. And that, that presents a certain amount of challenge in bringing the messaging, the messaging across and conveying, uh, uh, convey, conveying how important this is and how much this is becoming a global concern. In some ways, I don't think it's all that hard, though, because, I mean, our own society is living with this, with the consequences, in a much more vivid and daily way than if you were to talk about malaria or TB, or, or it's true also with HIV. I mean, the, the, uh, this is something that people can understand in terms of the threat of, of non-communicable disorders and, and, and the need for adjustments on multiple levels to that. Trevor. Still on the outcomes? Yes. Or the, the, the main messages? On the main messages. Um. I can't be sure what that final main message is, but I would hope it, um, that if I, if I call it, that the main message exudes an end to blameology. What is blameology? <laughs> Non-communicable disease is you know, often seen to be a result of poor choices. We know, in fact, that only about a third of non-communicable disease can be changed by changes in diet changes in physical exercise. And we should obviously prevent the preventable, no question about it. But you've got two-thirds that so certainly need to be controlled, thought about, uh, and there needs to be a whole spectrum of interventions. It's very complicated, but you know it can be uh, really brought down to one page. Um, so all society, there's got needs to be all levels. Uh, and, and I certainly hope that the message that government send uh, is you know, a message of inclusion. Um, a, a very important report just two days ago by the UN on disability. There's so, so many people around the world that feel completely excluded from society. And I'm not talking just about the lack of a ramp by which they can actually go up and, and you know, some stairs. Uh, I mean, truly inclusionary in, in all aspects of the word, uh, and an end to blameology um, in the context of non-communal disease control, whatever that main message may be. Let me invite our audience to come forward with any comments or questions. At this point on this cycle, we're going to move in a moment to consideration around how to navigate these major, these five major challenges that I have outlined. But please come forward if, if you have any questions um, or comments uh, uh, to add at this point while we're waiting for that. Um, the, uh, the, the approach of this moment in New York. Um, we don't really, uh, you know, most people are not yet poised to really think about this here. I mean, it's not part of our 
It's not part of our consciousness yet too much at a popular level. What is it going to take to, in your view, get, make that change, make that change in terms of connecting to a popular audience that reads the newspaper, that it has an interest in foreign affairs, uh, that, is, that, that, that wants to be convinced that what is going to happen is, is, is important in driving things forward on the global health agenda. Paul, what do you think? Steve, actually, the first thing that comes to mind for me is a, is a brand of some sort. Um, we don't have the, you know, the, the red bow. Uh, we don't have the, any number of different symbols that are out there uh, for, for different diseases. We have a hard time in the NCD community putting a face on our story. Um, I mean, even, even the label non-communicable diseases is an amalgamation of, well, we're talking about four, but there's another right. whole world of other diseases and conditions that constitute non-communicable diseases. So um, we're still struggling with how to, how, to, how to put a brand on it, how to make it clear to the average person on the street what we're talking about. Uh, your and your task. One of your tasks at the alliance is creating a brand. Creating a brand. Um, well, and I think I think you know NCDs is, is for better. You know that's that's the that's the term that's come up. What surprises me, having having lived through the AIDS crisis, is how many people actually don't even know what HIV stands for anymore. But they know you know that that's not a positive. But it means that things can kind of become their initials eventually, and that's an okay thing. So in terms of the brand, um, I think that there's general consensus that this is what we've moved towards. Um, in terms of how to how to shift that consciousness, I think it I think getting um, uh, you know a couple of campaign um, ideas that are underway, we we hope will help with that. But I do think it's going to be some very high level political leadership and statements, and getting a couple of key people to commit to coming to the meeting, getting that out is going to be really uh, essential. Peter. You went through the whole period of trying to create the consciousness and and branding around HIV, and and, and now what? As you look back, what do you think? Well, I, I think I'm going to actually focus on creating a brand at the national level. Mm -hmm. And even though HIV is known by virtually every every adult in most of the developing countries. Uh, we sometimes forget. Uh, I remember an episode, I was in Mozambique several years ago, and I was talking to the director of medical services, and he asked, I asked him whether, there was, uh, whether he was interested in uh, hypertension or cardiovascular diseases. And he said actually he went to the U USAID mission and asked for some help uh, to help with the stroke cases that uh, all, most of his wards are filled with. And uh, the mission person, uh, this was five years ago, said, sorry, we don't have any money for NCDs, but if you want to do a program in HIV, we'll be happy to support you. And the director of medical services said, I'm the director of health services, not for HIV. The point here is that there's been recognition at the country level for a long time. When I was in medical school 40 years ago, half of the patients in the medical ward were stroke cases. Myocardial infection was rare, but have uh, uh, diabetes and a lot of those things. So it shouldn't be too difficult to get the recognition that we need at the national level. And uh, because people have been dying from these diseases, um, and the same thing happened with HIV. Um, it was the fatality, it was the, the fact that it was not curable, it was the fact that uh, a lot of people you saw Everybody knew somebody. I was in Zambia, uh, our country office, uh, a few weeks ago, and I asked the question, how many of you in this room, there are about 60 people in FHI staff, either has a relative or a friend who has had a cardiovascular disease, and 90% of the people raised their hands. It is there. That's right. Yeah. Please, please introduce yourself and, and, and offer your comment or question. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Farah Mateen. I'm a PhD student in international health at Johns Hopkins. I'm an adult neurologist uh, by training, so I was uh, definitely struck by your comments on stroke. Um, every time I go uh, abroad to do uh, what we consider to be tropical neurology, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of stroke and head injury and epilepsy that I see. Um, I've been listening to non-communicable uh, disease talks uh, throughout the day, and one thing that struck me was that we don't hear very much about non-communicable diseases in adolescents or in children. We tend to believe that non-communicable diseases are only in the aging and the elderly population, or at least in older adults. And as a neurologist, I guess, just thinking about epilepsy, again, head injuries, cerebral palsy, birth defects, that uh, non-communicable diseases are certainly not limited to adults, and perhaps that's being overlooked. Thank you. Yeah. Any of you care to uh, add comment to it, on type this? One di sorry, Steve. Uh, add to it, type 1 diabetes, scoliosis, uh, hole in the heart, um, you name a variety of different conditions. Certainly, they can be added to the list. And, and Jerry Anderson at your school has been a tremendously yeah. decent spokesperson. <laughs> For these things, right, Srinath? Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, and, and so uh, the romantic heart disease. No, I mean, you go on and on and on. Yeah, but you're so right. I mean, what else can I do but verify your comments? You're so right. And I think the NCD Alliance has recently come out with some very good pieces on women's health and NCDs, which obviously confronts the, the mythology surrounding the fact that it's only men, old men, uh, dying of that, and it's certainly about child children's health as well. Some some really uh, jaw dropping statistics on this. Yeah we, yeah, we have so. a new publication on children and STDs that I believe we can get it. Well, one of the things that needs to be emphasized is that uh, many of these problems start even in childhood. Yes. Not only habits are indoctrinated <coughs> in childhood, but even biological changes start appearing in childhood. Even there are envi gene environmental interactions in which the environment modifies genetic expression, epigenetics. All of that can happen in, even in the womb and in early childhood. So the fact that NCDs actually have an impact across the lifespan, beginning with childhood mm -hmm. and adolescence, is something that we ought to really project. Because anything happening adversely to children's health arouses outrage. And like it happened with secondhand smoke hurting children. And now obesity in children is becoming an emotive issue. So I think focusing the impact of NCDs and the causal factors of NCDs on ch children and adolescents is a useful pathway to take for advocacy. Thank you. Johanna, did you have a chance to complete your thought there? No, no, I just wanted to reference the, the Children and NCDs um, publication. It's available at the NCD Alliance booth in the exhibition hall. You should definitely pick it up. Thank you. We have some additional comments and questions. Hi, my name is Tui Bui from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I heard some uh, of you said that um, NCD should be a country-led in, um, initiatives, and I'm encouraged to hear that. At the same time, I'm concerned that, especially when I'm thinking of low-income countries, um, where they suffer from a double or triple burdens of diseases, both from still from communicable and non-communicable diseases, where, um, I mean, the reality is that you need donor infusion to combat HIV, AIDS, and communicable diseases. Um, do you think that ministers and leaders from those countries is going to embrace the NCD without donor infusion um, to combat NCDs? That's a very fundamental question in terms of is this pattern of response going to be different? Not driven by external donors, but driven by demand and leadership in countries. Who wants to take this on? Yeah, very briefly. Uh, when we say country driven and co or country led, it does not mean there shouldn't be external funding. But I think that we also have learned enough lessons from a lot of programs, like immunization, uh, HIV, that it is important for countries uh, to take the lead, uh, to make sure they recognize they have a problem, and start, start taking steps. The second point is that there are a lot of things countries can do without a lot of funding. Uh, policy issues, tobacco, uh, whether smoking or whether increasing taxes, uh, food industry. There are a lot of things that countries should, uh, the examples that have been given in New York, those are more policy related rather than uh, funding related. And the last point is that um, almost like HIV, CBD or NCDs are, are multisexual approaches. They are not 
uh, medical interventions, there are interventions that uh, involve agricultural uh, food production. There are a whole host of things that the government are best uh, uh, can deal with this better than uh, donors. Definitely the external funding will be needed, but we need to, at the country level, we, make to, we need to make sure that we are taking the lead, coordinating, uh, and also making sure that we're getting community involvement, civil society, and the private sector at the country level. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Gretchen Van Vliet. I'm with FHI. Um, my concern is that our entire global health workforce has been very focused on being trained to deal with infectious diseases and communicable diseases. And yet, we're expecting donors and governments to very quickly take up the mantle of non-communicable diseases without necessarily having a trained workforce or even a, a set of organizations like an FHI prepared with a skill set that can be responsive to the kinds of interventions that will be needed. Um, and so, is this something that the Alliance has thought about and that will be addressed during UNGAS? Thank you. We have the training issue. Johanna, you want to lead off straight now? Um, yeah, in terms of training, yes, of course, the Alliance is very much thinking about this. Um, the, the good news is that we are an alliance of federations, federations with some s very strong on the ground capacity, but there's no question that there needs to be more training of the people that we have on the ground. But we've got, we've got the voices on the ground and the people on the ground. Did you have a... As a follow-up, you know, with the, with the era of integration, you know, thinking about training in a different way rather than recognizing or saying that we need a new set of workers, what are the skills that we can, you know, provide, the, the training that we can provide to the workers that we currently have on the ground and that currently work with both the ministry and health, de health departments with NGOs and that kind of thing, and thinking about training differently in maybe that more primary care approach. And FHI is already doing that, but I would differ between that. Dr. Reddy. Uh, I, I think you gave the answer yourself in the last phrase when you said primary <laughs> health care approach. I may have. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the bad news is that we are uniformly short across most low- and middle-income countries in terms of health workforce overall. The good news is that we do not really require sophisticated approaches. If we actually focus on frontline health workers and mid-level health workers, we can get much done and deliver uh, in terms of NCD prevention and even management. Uh, therefore, strategies should include development of community health workers in a variety of health services delivery, preventive, promotive, and essential primary health care. Then even at the level of secondary health care, you can get mid-level health workers and what is being called task sharing and task shifting, in which you actually multi-skill health workers is possible. Again, getting, you don't need a full-fledged doctor. There are doctor equivalents with three years training. There are specialist nurses who are being trained for this purpose. So we really ought to look at reorientation of our existing health workforce along with some reskilling so that we can actually utilize them much more effectively rather than create huge vertical cadres just for this purpose. Paul, you. If I could, I just wanted to add a, a word or two about health system strengthening in general. Um, uh, clearly, the, the health systems in most low-income countries are in need of all sorts of assistance, even for the communicable uh, disease side, and there needs to be a, a general re-looking at things in order to embrace non-communicable disease in general. But it's the same kind of things. I mean, we can talk about financing or, or training or uh, medical supplies and equipment. Um, it's the same kind of building blocks, if you will, um, that, that can be adapted, tweaked, and, and strengthened to, to embrace non-communicable disease as well. And I think there's been a, a dramatic um, increase in attention on health system strengthening in the last couple of years that, that has the potential to begin to enfold a lot of the things that we're talking about. Trevor, I know this training <coughs> issue has been a big big factor in your thinking and Medtronic's thinking. Can you offer some comment? Well, I think, that, I mean, the, the nice part of it is that, well, for medical technology companies in any case, you know, training is a huge part of what we do. Uh, there's obviously ethical boundaries between uh, the training that we do and then ultimately the sales process, but, it, but the nice thing I think about medical technology is that it, medical technology companies in, in writ large is that they offer providing sort of a, an add-on 
if you will, to the training process that, that, that was first learned in medical schools. We're not unique uh, that Medtronic in doing that. A lot of other companies are involved in that capacity building. And once they've received the training, let's say neurosurgery training to our colleague, and the neurologist, they're able to take that training and to do whatever they would like to do with that uh, training. Uh, so certainly training up uh, tertiary care uh, doctors of all, um, of all specialties is, is, is key to the business proposition uh, of, of companies like ours, but at the same time are huge contributions to capacity building in a lot of other countries that may or may not have that training already at present. Thank you. Sir. Good evening. My name is Walter Strauss. I'm a infectious I work in the area of infectious diseases and vaccines at Merck, the pharmaceutical company, but I happen to be a, an adult gastroenterologist by training. Um, I, and I, working in the private sector, I think a lot about how private sector uh, solutions can, can help address public health problems. And I look back on the uh, situation with uh, HIV in South Africa and recall that a really sentinel moment was when uh, several very large um, companies, employers in South Africa, realized that HIV AIDS was taking a very significant toll on their workforce. And they really became you know, the catalyst for, for change in, um, in addressing HIV AIDS in, in South Africa. In the area of non-communicable diseases, I think the situation is um, quite com complex. Um, many of these diseases are uh, diseases with, that are indolent for a number of years. And I think that the, con the, the, the economic consequences of many of these diseases actually fall on um, disproportionately on older individuals when they may not be, uh, they may be at the tail end of their working careers. So I'm not quite sure that the same economic arguments might play out um, in the area of taking, having large employers in developing countries take some ownership of um, non-communicable diseases and to be part of the solution. So I wonder what your thoughts are. That's an interesting argument. I mean, we have a, people living longer. We have aging societies. We have the, the whole dimension around caring for these populations and the burden that this presents. Who would like to jump in, Paul? Yeah, I, I'd actually uh, like to take take exception to that statement, uh, mm -hmm. beginning with uh, with the situation in in Europe and Eurasia where we work. Uh, people are are dying uh, of these diseases or becoming disabled an average of about 20 years earlier than they are in Western Europe. So uh, we are impacting. Uh, people at the, at the peak of their earning years. And if we look at, um, at uh, disability and death for women of reproductive age, we're finding overwhelmingly that it's non-communicable disease and injuries that are killing uh, those women. Um, so from, from my perspective, and I think that we will talk a little bit more about that uh, earlier or later, is that you know if we're if we're really interested in addressing um, the health and welfare of women of reproductive age and their young children, then perforce we have to look at the things that are that are really killing and disabling them and impacting the incomes and welfares of, of their families. Uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, it's well known now, as has been said, that in low and middle income countries, a fairly large fraction of deaths due to chronic diseases occur below the age of 70. In India, about 40% of all cardiovascular disease related deaths occur below the age of 64 years. And that's a major problem. And even those who do not die would have acquired disability because of early events. And this has an impact definitely on productivity, on family fortunes, because family incomes are lost, children's education and nutrition suffers when the wage earner is disabled. So there are cascading effects. It also has an adverse effect not only in the labor market, but also on the consumer market. If most of the people are spending their money on expensive cardiac procedures, then they, don't, they can't buy other goods. So there is an economic impact which is quite adverse in the developing countries. And that is uh, an argument that may not necessarily appear very apparent in societies such as this,
but it's clearly a compelling argument in our circumstances. Let's take one more comment and question, then we're going to yeah, turn I, to the, yeah, the I, second I, question. Yes, sir. Second one? Yeah. I, I was an early volunteer in the Peace Corps under JFK, and two of our signal doctors at that time were, were Dr. Schweitzer from Gabon. Uh, I don't know what that country is today, and Dr. Dooley in Laos. And I was wondering, and they were very uh, culturally adapted uh, doctors in those environments, and I was wondering what you may have learned from them, or what you have done in 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 practicing uh, medicine uh, in in the lesser developed countries, uh, from the standpoint of culture and ethnic, uh, you know, local medicine, if you, so to speak. Thank you. Um, I think the question there is around what are, if you're talking about NCDs, is there a particular cultural dimension to this in calibrating the response and how does that play across these different environments? Is that a factor? Yes. Body and soul are one. And how that's defined and how that's carried out in terms of non-communicable disease control is very different, right? Uh, you know, Asian traditional medicine, African traditional medicine, if it hits the soul, that's obviously going to have a direct re 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 rehabilitative impact upon the patient, mentally, but also then physically. It's not only the advent of medical technologies and pharmaceuticals that are going to get at that. Just as an example, a founder of our company who's the, uh, who lives on Hawaii is in, very enthused about meditation and very welcoming of, of Asian best practices. So I don't know that there's a one Obviously, you have to have a sensitivity. The way in which one attacks it is very culturally sensitive, and, and certainly, uh, you know, cultural adaptations should be welcome. Uh, and, and I and I think that uh, some may mistake Western companies from sort of having an all size, or so one, one size fits all approach, and that's certainly not the case. Let's turn our attention to the whole question around the outstanding challenges and how are we going to manage these enduring challenges. I, just to repeat, I mean. We need to be able to define goals and targets in a realistic and clear and feasible way and tie those to the existing agenda in some fashion. Leverage resources in the midst of tough times, integrate the business sector effectively into solutions and overcome the wariness or the hostility and the antagonisms, form a coherent and durable social movement out of a complex set of interests. So there's a lot less it's a lot, a lot more challenging than, than what we've faced uh, in, in other settings. And, in, and really cementing that high level political leadership. So what's this, as you look at this array of challenges that are in front of us, you're making progress. There's no question, there's momentum. Things are moving forward. You've got these continued challenges here. Peter, how are we going to navigate our way forward? What's your view on the most effective strategy? Actually, I will take one of those uh, five areas, and that is leveraging resources. We, there was a meeting, an HIV high-level meeting, I, I believe, last week. Uh, currently, $10 billion is being spent a year, and they are asking for another $6 billion, so $16 billion a year. And they also project that they would like to have 15 million people on treatment uh, by the year 2015, and that will cost about $24 billion. The point I'm making here is that there is finite, finite resources. And even though we are hopeful that the meeting in September will also lead, generate resources uh, for NCDs, the Lancet uh, NCD group, uh, I think, projects that uh, they will need, will need about $9 billion for the 23 high uh, prevalent countries, as far as NCDs are concerned, uh, for three priority interventions. We cannot, it's unlikely that we're going to get a billions of dollars to develop vertical programs. So here, the point here is that how can we leverage the resources that are available? One of the uh, ways is to make sure that we are strengthening the health services horizontally to address multiple issues, and not only HIV mm -hmm. and CDs and other health issues. The second is to learn to integrate 
programs, uh, whether it's HIV or all chronic disease like HIV and NCDs, or maternal and child health and women's uh, NCD uh, related NCDs, including the cancers that affect women, uh, or it may be uh, integrating uh, some of the intersectoral approaches. Uh, the third, we also said country-driven and country-led. There has to be uh, uh, national commitments. There are countries, uh, I think Rwanda and Malawi, as far as HIV is concerned, where the external don uh, input into their programs is about 90% of their funding for, for HIV. That can continue to happen. Countries have to make the commitment, uh, uh, whether it's... Uh, uh, budgetary commitments or simply contributing to, uh, to, uh, to, some, to some of these uh, programs. So we have to find better ways of making sure we are leveraging the resources, not expect all the resources to come externally. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to wait a long time before we can, uh, we're going to have effective programs that can be scaled enough to make a difference. Johanna. Um, I would just build on that and say, so it, it, in one way we need a change in consciousness of how we work with donors and external funding. I think we also need a change in consciousness of how we work with the private sector. Um, I think civil society needs to, um, to really uh, understand that we can work with the private sector um, in a very meaningful and positive way um, and, and separate out the, the, the negative um, instances from the, from the very positive ways that we can um, and should and do engage. Um, and celebrate the successes that private sector is making in this space as well. Thank you, Paul. Actually, Steve, I'd like to talk about two of your challenges, okay. resources and leadership. Um, and you've already mentioned that this is not the HIV AIDS discussion of 2001. Uh, we've got, a, and people are going to hear this over and over again as things go into, uh, lead towards September. It is indeed a very difficult economic environment. And I think we can anticipate that donor countries, and not just the United States government, I might add, donor countries in general can be expected to be pretty cautious about any targets that carry with them significant financial contributions uh, and commitments. Most donors are still wrestling with how to recognize and balance NCDs with the existing and still incomplete health agenda. How do they take new priorities while existing priorities already are underfunded. So in, in, that, in that kind of context, uh, at least in my mind, there, there's several things that begin to point the way forward, at least uh, in thinking. For me, um, first and foremost, we need to make sure that disease prevention, health promotion, and patient empowerment are priorities. Uh, whatever we do, it must be cost effective and we need to be able to prove that it's cost effective. Uh, we've already talked about health in all policies so, uh, and, and those kinds of things. We've already talked about the fact that countries can do a lot without donor assistance and uh, a lot can be done on the basis of, uh, of information, of awareness, of, of good offices. So just reinforming that. Um, and, uh, you know, countries are going to have to, again, lean heavily on collaboration uh, with foundations, with uh, non-governmental organizations, and also with the, with the for-profit private sector. Um, in talking about leadership, I'd like to start actually by, by uh, echoing uh, Peter's comments on integration. Donors have been very visible and clear um, about their commitments to the Millennium Development Goals, PEPFAR, Gavi, the Global Health Initiative, and the like. And it's absolutely imperative to donors that those efforts not be diluted. So part of leveraging leadership on NCDs is being clear that addressing NCDs also advances and accelerates progress on those existing and very visible goals and commitments. We need to show that NCD policies and programs complement rather than divert attention from those priorities, and they do. Um, uh, for example, we've, we've seen that uh, increased incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking leads to adverse birth outcomes and poor maternal health. We've seen that smoking mothers breastfeed for shorter periods 
have less milk and their milk is less nutritious. We've seen studies in India that, that uh, show that approximately half of all TB deaths are related to smoking. Uh, particularly amongst, amongst men. We've seen uh, studies in Mexico that draw a very close uh, correlation between diabetes and TB. Uh, we've seen studies in Bangladesh that basically say that if the, the, the money that families spend on tobacco were reoriented and diverted to buy food, then literally millions and millions of people would be spared malnutrition, and the estimates are that the child mortality due to malnutrition would drop precipitously. So uh, the point being that attention to NCDs can actually accelerate achievement of existing health priorities. Dr. Reddy, uh, what's, the, what's the best strategy for navigating this current environment, uh, in your view? I mean, I would not uh, be presumptuous enough to talk about a best strategy when all the strategies that have been described are very appropriate and very relevant strategies. I'll pick up one from your five challenges and then talk about how it applies to some of the things that have been said before. Among the challenges you listed, forming a coherent and enduring social movement. I think when we're talking about integration, it's not only integration within the health sector, which it is very important that we integrate within the health sector with infectious diseases, nutrition, and other groups. But many of the determinants of NCDs also have wider implications. Uh, they are linked to issues of environment. They are linked to issues of food security. Like, for example, tobacco has 4.3 million hectares of arable land devoted to tobacco cultivation, hmm. which is totally unpardonable in a world which faces food insecurity. Similarly, when you talk about industrial life scale livestock breeding, which not only has an impact on red meat consumption for cancers and cardiovascular disease, but produces 50% of the global methane mm -hmm. and consumes a huge amount of water resources and diverts grain for grain feeding of animals. Similarly, when you're talking about uh, a number of zoonotic diseases, the Institute of Medicine report says that over the last uh, 30, 40 years, there has been a new outbreak every year, and 60% of them are zoonotic, animal to human transmitted. Mm -hmm. And it's not accidental, because we are actually increasing livestock breeding on an industrial scale, resulting in not only deforestation, but also building a conveyor belt between wildlife, veterinary population, and human population, allowing mutation, migration of hitherto confined viruses and vectors. So it is this connectivity to elements of sustainable development, which are of common concern to a much larger segment of humanity that need to be emphasized. Mm -hmm. And when we build about that kind of a social movement, the number of stakeholders in this would increase. We cannot appear to be sectarian and say that, OK, NCDs have been long marginalized. Please give us a space and light today. We have to say, yes, we are important because of the public health dimension. But we share other concerns with you, and it's time for us to get together and build a healthier society. So whether it is behavior change among politicians or behavior change among the general public, you need a broader social movement. And that social movement has to unite all of these concerns. And we have to move from medicine to public health and from public health to sustainable development as the overarching framework. I'd like to invite anyone who care to come forward. Do you have a question and comment? Hi, good evening. Uh, Rick Burrs on uh, NIH. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a much, much, much harder sell than, than what we did around infectious diseases with HIV and, and related uh, conditions. Um, you know, there's, there's the economic argument that was made by the gentleman from Merck. Uh, there are issues of, you know, um, <coughs> modeling, I mean, how, how do you best uh, demonstrate cost effectiveness through complex work that is uh, not particularly well understood by uh, people in the field to demonstrate that there are cost offsets uh, uh, with respect to trying to uh, 
demonstrate that, the, that there's a good reason to focus on non-communicable diseases. Uh, you know, there's, there are all kinds of issues uh, around doing that. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, I'm just thinking it through and, you know, so what's the glue that holds, that holds uh, this kind of um, initiative together with what we're doing in, around infectious diseases? And uh, it, it may be just, you know, uh, building the capacity around strong uh, primary care and focusing on that um, as, a, as a way of, of getting at both infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. And, um, and that's not going to be a cakewalk either because there are a number of countries um, where uh, physicians have a fairly strong base and, and they may not be particularly happy economically with, with having mid-levels come in and uh, uh, provide care that may um, uh, that they may perceive as being threatening to their profession. I mean, we had that in this country with physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Those kinds of issues are uh, are taking place now in countries like South Africa. So uh, it it's just that uh, it's not that we shouldn't do this. It's just that we ought to go into it with eyes open because it's going to be very challenging to try to shift focus or or make a make a, a reasonable transition. Um, you know, continuing to deal with uh, infectious diseases at the same time, um, having a, a hard look at chronic illness and what we can do to there uh, to, uh, to deal with that problem. Thank so. you. Our speakers like to react to that? I'll, I'll just, it's good to see you, Rick. Um, I, I would just agree with you. Uh, more or less, it is going to be, it is a complicated process. Uh, and. We are just beginning that uh, that process and that venture. There's a lot that we that we know. There's a lot that we can already apply and do. Uh, there's a lot that we can uh, can can replicate. Um, at the same time, um, there's a lot that we still have to learn. And I'm hoping that uh, that information research, uh, monitoring, and evaluation will be a significant part of, of this overall process. Again, I, I think it is endemic upon us to be able to demonstrate uh, and provide the evidence for, for the things that we, uh, and the choices that we ultimately make. Sir. Um, Howard Hu from the University of Michigan. Um, I'm actually uh, an academic and a lot of the portfolio of research of our department is funded by NIH. and. Um, my apologies to my colleague because actually my remarks are somewhat uh, in contrast to the somewhat pessimistic prognostication of where we can go with this portfolio of ideas about addressing non-communicable disease. Uh, Srinath pointed out that in fact uh, some of the progress in chronic disease will have to do with linking uh, non-communicable disease with the whole idea of sustainability. And in fact, uh, although the private sector is here, uh, the private sector that is here are the folks from drug companies, from the folks who are doing, uh, you know, uh, the uh, USAID funded work. And the private sector that's not here is, are the industries like manufacturing, like the extraction industries, and some of these industries are the very industries that are embracing sustainability and are galloping ahead of governments, are galloping ahead of where the researchers are because they can already see where society is going. Uh, some of our graduates who, who I chair a Department of Environmental Sciences, uh, who are out there as the health and safety officers for corporations are coming back to us and telling us, you know, now we've been identified as the chief sustainability officers because our companies understand that even though the United States won't sign on the climate change agreement, it's definitely going to happen. We're going to have to do something about carbon emissions and our environmental footprint. And I would say that to actually make progress on the non-communicable disease and understand the whole uh, the whole background of things that will contribute towards chronic disease. It's land use for tobacco, it's going to be how we design our cities. Um, 
we need to involve that portion of the private sector that's not here, but who are actually going to be building our cities, who are actually going to be cultivating our land, and who see some of the sustainability future as uh, that may not be you know, something we've been able to do the research because NIH doesn't fund research like that, that is, you know, how sustainability impacts health. But in fact, that is uh, in some way uh, obvious to many of the people who are running our corporations and who are, um, who are on the ground and seeing uh, in the future where our best uh, our strategies will be to improve health, not just non-communicable disease, but health in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have one last comment, and then we'll come back to close. Yes, sir. It's always nice to get the last word. <laughs> okay. uh, my name's You've Andy Benson. Uh, I'm with the uh, International Food Information Council uh, out of Washington, D.C. We're a science-based communications organization that hopes to help to enable public understanding and informed decision. Uh, I realize that this is a very, very complex issue. It's multifaceted, and we've talked about economics, we've talked about environment, we've talked about policy, we've talked about science, we've talked about sustainability, political leadership. Um, we've also talked about the challenge of branding this issue, if I could use your term there, and that if we go outside this room, even into the street outside, and talk to local people about NCDs, they'd wonder what the hell we are talking about, excuse my French. Um, we're focusing on the complex, we're focusing on stealing, and I mean galvanizing political leadership. But I think as we do that, we need to put this into a broader perspective. The one thing we've had very little discussion on today is communicating to the publics that we serve, to the stakeholders, to the individuals, to telling them what an NCD is and some very simple messaging on what they can do to help themselves. Now, yes, we've got to address all the complex issues, but if we spend the next two years doing that and then think afterwards about messaging to the public, a lot of water has gone under the bridge, and a lot of opportunity for self-empowerment uh, has, has passed away. And I think self-empowerment, as well as the political will, is very, very important because people Consumers, citizens, love to be helped, love to be guided, love to be supported, but they hate to be dictated to. And anybody in this room who has children, who has aspirations to children, and I see people suffering from NCDs as children that we hopefully can take care of. If you tell them what to do, are your children likely to do that? Or to kind of continue doing what they want to do? Even worse, if you tell your children what not to do, then they dig in their heels and stick to their guns and say, well, that's all very well from where you're coming from, but I want choice. I'm an individual. This is a democracy. Please don't dictate to me. The success is to understand where they're coming from, to help them to do our work diligently and appropriately as a community, but to help them understand, to facilitate, to guide, and empower them. And I think we need to start thinking about that earlier rather than later. Thank you. And thinking about how we can communicate, having some sort of task force on that, and uh, Thank you. simple messaging. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. We're getting to the end of the hour here. I'm going to ask our, our speakers, really, to offer us some, one single closing thought on what's the most important thing it needs to happen between now and September to sort of raise the prospects of success. Trevor, why don't you lead off and let's, and then we'll go to Srinath and Paul on down the line. Trevor. Plain and simple, we need the heads of state to be present. Uh, Manmohan Singh has announced his uh, intent to come. Dilma Rousseff has equally campaigned on the issue of cancer and has said she's going to come. Russia hosted the, probably the most important meeting in coming up. We believe that the Chinese will also come, but it has to be, it has to be truly all heads of state. Um, and without all of those heads of state, <clears throat> including one a few blocks down, where we've been obviously encouraging. Talking about Canada? Uh, 
we've been encouraging uh, the missus to bring her husband uh, to the party in, in September. We need to have all North South countries, big, small, and all sizes. If we don't have that degree of uh, attendance, yeah. the chance for success diminishes. Thank you. Serena. I see success already evolving in the sense that there is a great recognition. This conference itself is symbolic of yes. that. But with specific reference to the UN summit, what we need to do between now and the UN summit, apart from mobilizing the political commitment at the national level so that it is reflected in New York, there's been one glaring problem which has not been ad adequately addressed. That is the engagement of other UN agencies other than WHO. I must say WHO has been providing leadership to this effort, but a UN summit is wasted if other UN agencies are not constructively and very strongly engaged. Otherwise, you might have as well have this meeting in the World Health Assembly. The advantage of multi-sectorality is reflected not only by the heads of state, but also by the active engagement of other UN agencies. So these three months, not only we must lobby the politicians back home, but we must lobby the UN agencies, other UN agencies, UNDP, FAO, World Bank, everybody else, so that they sing from the same hymn sheet. Thank you. Paul. Dr. Reddy talked uh, a few minutes ago about uh, working together uh, symbiotically for a better world. And uh, I think that's one of the messages that I want to, to convey. That for me, it's really imperative that we continue the dialogue and discussions uh, to advance NCDs as uh, complementary to rather than competitive with traditional health mm -hmm. assistance. Thank you, John. Uh, get Obama to the meeting, and if she can't come, see if her husband's available. Excellent. How will you? Peter, this is your turf here. This is the sovereign state of FHI here this evening. That's right. <laughs> you get the last word. Simple thing is that. For us to diversify the social movement beyond international organizations, get it to the community level, uh, at the country level, to, in order to maintain and sustain this beyond, uh, by the summit and beyond the summit. Okay. That was our last word. I want to th please join me in thanking our speakers here this evening. Again, I want to thank our sponsors, Al Siemens. Ward Cates and the many other friends from FHI. Thank you very much.